we're all earthlings, right? Right? Could you consider yourself an earthling? You know, and then, so then we call that, uh, oh, Bucky Fuller call it spaceship earth. You get the idea that, you know, we're on a spaceship hurtling through space. And uh, the indigenous folks to whom you and I are all related ancestrally call that Mother Earth. And it's interesting that if you uh, read some of the biological chemical makeup of your body and my body, it's the same proportion of water in land, water in mass in your body. It's the same pr proportion. Same with the salinity in your body is identical to the salinity in the oceans. I find that really interesting. Yeah, it's like Mother Earth. And if you check out the, you know, the molecules in your body and the trace minerals in your body, that's identical to what you're going to find on the planet. So, ugh, where do we come from, right? Interesting. OK. So I want to share with you, um, when I was about eight years old, my father and all his brothers who had been in the Second World War, uh, I found a book that had come from one of my uncles. He was in Europe during the war. And um, going through the pages, and I'd never seen anything like this before, all these soldiers and you know, buildings that were collapsed. And, and then there was this one photo that just absolutely stunned me. And it was a picture of bodies stacked up, skin and bones, high, long, like firewood. Wow. And I didn't know what to make of it. And I took the book to my dad and I said, Dad, what's, what is this? I mean, I didn't believe that's not real, except it was real. And he said, uh, well, that's war. He says, wars are awful. And interestingly enough, most of the people that get in, killed in wars are not soldiers. They're non-combatants, civilians. Anyway, that has never left me. It's kind of like we have a job to do. It's a mission here, get the world to work. And I don't think I'm the only person who has that mission, although you know, we express it in different ways, get the world to work. So, um, oh yeah, this thing. So I want to um, share a little bit about my journey this is Buck Minister Fuller, Bucky Fuller. And I met him actually a couple times. Uh, at the building in the back, by the way, he's the guy who uh, invented geodesic domes, dome, dome houses, all the sports domes. He's, he is way ahead of his time. He's a futurist. And there was a point in his life where he was really questioning his validity as a human being. And he got the idea from somewhere that well, the way he said it is, what kind of uh, use could he be put to given that he was a throwaway? He had, he had failed, his child had died, he had a, a whole, lot of breakdowns. And he was a very unhappy guy, seriously considering suicide. And his, he asked this question, what, what use could universe have for a throwaway? And he had this amazing insight, which was to create what he called artifacts from the future to demonstrate what's possible. So earlier we saw some pictures of possible futures, you know, Mars and electric airplanes, awesome stuff, right? He was that kind of guy. Okay, he invented a whole kind, a new kind of uh, geometry and mathematics, tensegrity, uh, structures that are super strong, take way less materials. But he inspired me because he really lived inside of a question, what kind of a difference could one little individual make? What kind of a difference could a person make that some big organization, some government couldn't make? And it turns out that there is something that you and I can do that no other entity can do. And a way to say it is we have the power to create. Groups don't create. Groups do not create. 
great creativity lives at the level of each individual. Another way to say that is nobody can choose for you. Unless, of course, you advocate, but then even that's a choice. If you say, never mind, I'll just go with whatever the group says, comes up with, that's my choice. That's a choice. You're going to choose something. By the way, the subtitle to my talk is, You and I Matter, whether you like it or not. So if you take action, you're committed to making a difference, great. If you decide that, well, I don't make any difference, I'm just one out of seven billion people, what difference do I make? And then you live your life that way, that's the impact that you're going to make. It's going to impact one way or another. So um, Bucky had a question. Here's Bucky's question. If the success of, or failure of the planet and of all human beings depended on how I am and what I do, how would I be and what would I do? So I actually looked at this question deeply. And you know, when I was 17, I want to just share with you, I went to South America with my older brother. He was in the Peace Corps. Went to Bogota, Colombia. And we went to the center of the city on a Sunday to the plaza for the, where the, the marketplace is. And uh, I, I'd never seen poverty before. You know, I grew up in the United States in a very wealthy, really wealthy country. And I'd never seen poverty. And there was this little kid, eight years old. His name was Luis. And he came up, he wanted to shine my shoes. And so he shined my shoes. And I noticed that there was a couple other smaller kids. And my brother had a conversation. I didn't speak Spanish. He, my brother had a conversation. Luis was the head of the family. He was eight. His sister was six. And his little brother was five. Wow. So years later, I had an opportunity from meeting with Bucky Fuller and addressing this question to start to take a look at, well, what kind of a difference could I make? How do I want to live my life? Do I want to live my life like I make a difference? Do I want to live my life like I don't matter? Or I could matter a little bit? So, you know, ultimately, it's a choice. It's a creation. That's what I'm saying. You and I have the power to create, including ourselves. OK, back to the planet Earth. Here's another thing from Bucky. This is a statement that he made that really struck me. He said, a world, a, a world that works, it's supposed to say, for everyone and everything with no one and nothing left out. Now he says, to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the advantage of anyone. We are blessed with technology that would be indescribable to our forefathers. We have the wherewithal, the know-it-all, to feed everybody, clothe everybody, and give every human on Earth a chance. We know, we know now what we could never know before, that we now have the option of all humanity to make it successfully on this planet in this lifetime to induce all humanity to realize full, lasting economic and physical success, plus enjoyment of all the Earth without one individual interfering with or being advantaged at the expense of another. Whoa, that would be a transformation. To me, that's a game worth playing. So out of that, I participated uh, with an organization called The Hunger Project starting in 1977 that was committed to eliminating hunger in the world. And it was based on the principle that each of us as individuals matters. That we literally, and it isn't just you know, getting people together as parts. Each one of us could take responsibility for the whole thing, for the whole planet. That it's our planet, individually, but also in mass. And see, it's quite amazing when you get a group of people who are operating out of a sense of personal responsibility you know, like I'm owning this whether you are or not, and I invite you to participate with me and own it the way I own it. So it's a shared vision then. 
it creates a synergy that's not possible when we're just operating out of doing our parts. Yeah. So out of that, I worked with the Hunger Project, first as a volunteer. I should tell you, by the way, that at the beginning, the way they measure hunger in the world is by the infant mortality rate. That's the number of children that die before their first year of birth. And in 1977, when it first started, the Hunger Project, the infant mortality rate was at 107 deaths per thousand. So that means about one out of 10 kids didn't make it on the planet, globally. 20 years later, 1997, it was at 54, almost half. It's now at about 39. So although it doesn't get reported on the 6 o'clock news, folks, hunger's ending. And it came from a lot of work done by a lot of volunteers. I got to go on staff. I ended up being the global enrollment manager and the volunteer coordinator for about 600 volunteers around the world. <laughs> and out of that experience, you know, after I, it's, now I was a musician before I should tell you, I played music for about 20 years. After I completed my stay with the Hunger Project, I was invited to be a consultant. And I'm going, uh, I don't think so, I'm a musician. And he said, well, you, it's about people. Come with us, go on a couple of our meetings and see if you, you fit. So I did, and it was like, oh yeah, I could do this. So I, I got involved with consulting and change management and culture change and um, ended up working with a lot of small businesses, one of which is the world famous Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle. That flew a lot of focus. Anyway, and they were going out of business and that, it was very interesting to me. See, I'm saying, you know, wouldn't it be great if people could participate in their jobs and have the same kind of joy that volunteers do when they're working on a big project to make a difference. In fact, wouldn't it be great if we could create a context, create an interpretation about work that allowed people to go to work inside of and actually have their work make a difference? So you remember in the very beginning, I said the power that we have as individuals is the power to create interpretations, create context, create meaning. So with these guys at the fish market, they were very coachable, by the way. They were on the verge of going out of business, so they were very open to try some new things. So I said, well, let's create a context. Let's create a purpose for your business that's bigger than just making a living. You know, that's what they were doing. They come into work, and I asked them, so, you know, what is it you're up to? Well, we're making a living. You know, we want to make enough money to pay the bills and stay in business. Well, see, that's okay. That's what most people are doing. What would be something that inspired you? And they brainstorm. And one of the guys says, let's have a world famous fish market. And in the beginning, a, you know, the owner says, you nuts. That's a crazy idea. And then I whipped out my Einstein quote that says, unless an idea starts off as absurd, it doesn't have a chance. Well, it's outside the box. That's why it's absurd. So, and then we went around and they committed, each one of these guys. See, because creativity lives at the level of individual. We don't want buy-in because they're not generating it. They're buying in because they're complying with the what the boss says. No, we want each person to honestly look authentically and see, could you take ownership of this vision and commit yourself in your universe to making this happen, and, by the way, empower every one of your teammates, literally take responsibility for them also creating the vision. See, that's a whole different way to operate. By the way, that's the nature of a championship team. So they did. Now, I'm going to show one more quote in a minute. And I really want to get this across. There's a certain magic available to you and me when we're willing to operate like we're responsible for our own universe. I'm not kidding. And if you do it in alignment with a group of people, miracles happen. So here's the quote. It's about commitment. This is written by a mountain climber. He, uh, it's from the Scottish Himalayan expedition. His name was W.H. Murray. 
He says, until one is committed, there's hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is an elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plants, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no one could have dreamt would have come their way. He says, I've learned a deep respect for one of Goethe's couplets. Goethe was a German philosopher, lived in the 1700s, famous guy. Whatever you can do, or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. So they did that, and they're now world famous. They actually go all over the world doing corporate presentations and for associations, and they've been all over the world. And uh, interesting, right now they're negotiating for a reality TV series. Well, and you want to know, they didn't solicit any of it, any of it. They committed as a team, and they created a work culture where they truly support each other, empower, I'm going to just tell you, they love each other, and they aren't afraid to say so. And their whole commitment in selling fish is to make a difference for the people that walk by, even if they don't buy fish. They're out to make a difference in people's lives. So, back to Bucky's original question. Oh, there it is. If the, if the success or failure of this planet and of all human beings depended on how I am and what I do, how would I be and what would I do? So I want to leave you the, with that question and an invitation to commit yourself in some way in your neighborhood, you know, in your community, planet, you know, take on the planet, global warming, whatever. Commit yourself to making a difference. Thank you very much.